Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. And, and I think lots of times that the Lord allows people to pass us by or allows people to get things that we want just to expose our hearts, just so we can know and so we can be acknowledging that, all right, Lord, I, I get it. I still have some growing to do. I still have some maturing to do. And, and so we don't want to be murmuring against the Lord. We don't want to be, that's not fair. Why'd they get, or how come, or... Today we have part two of Pastor Sam's message, A Faithful Servant. We are in Matthew chapter 20, starting up in verse 10. Now the main point we are exploring in this message is what it means to be a servant and why it is so important. So let's listen in. When they came, they supposed they would receive more, and they likewise received a denarius. And when they had received it, they murmured against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour. You made them equal, equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. You got to know that when it comes to things spiritual, we are equal before the Lord, and we can be grateful for that. And if you're working harder or trying harder or doing more, praying more, reading more, whatever the case might be, just be grateful for the opportunity. Don't compare yourself with others. And, and you never want to be putting yourself in a position where you're criticizing the Lord or complaining against the Lord, murmuring against the Lord. And here's why. Romans 1 says that that ingratitude, that ungrateful spirit... It is a rung on the ladder to destruction. Now, ordinarily, we think of ladders going up. So picture you're in a boat. You want to get out of the boat. There's a ladder. You climb down. That's really what Romans is saying. It's saying that this, there, there is a ladder and it's, it's, a, it's going down. And, and when you are ungrateful for whatever God has done for you or whatever God's doing in you or providing for you, well, what you're doing is you're saying that God's unfair. And isn't that, in fact, what... We have said, well, maybe we don't put his name in it. We're at work. Someone gets the promotion. Someone gets the raise. Somebody gets the, well, the acknowledgement. And, and we put a lot of work in. We didn't get a promotion. We didn't get a raise. We weren't acknowledged. And what's our thought? That's not fair. This isn't right. I deserve better. I deserve more. What are we doing? We're criticizing. We're complaining. We're comparing. We're elevating ourselves. And, and I think lots of times that, the Lord allows people to pass us by or allows people to get things that we want just to expose our hearts, just so we can know and so we can be acknowledging that, all right, Lord, I, I get it. I still have some growing to do. I still have some maturing to do. And, and so we don't want to be murmuring against the Lord. We don't want to be, that's not fair. Why'd they get, or how come, or, well, we, we want to know that Whatever the Lord provides for us is perfect for us. So he answers one of them, verse 13, and says, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. If I wish to give this last man the same as to you, is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? You know, whenever we are jealous or envious or ungrateful or comparing or criticizing, we're basically saying the Lord's not just, that the Lord's not fair, that the Lord's not righteous. And so we want to make sure that's, well, if that's a habit, we want to deal with that today. We want to confess that and say, Lord, last Sunday we'll be together of this year. Let's make this the last day that that's a habit. And if it creeps back in down the road, Lord, forgive me afresh. You know, I don't want to think this way. I don't want to be this way. I don't want to be comparing and criticizing and complaining. I don't want to think I'm due more than I'm due. I know it's all grace, Lord. You chose me before the foundation of the world. You've called me and gifted me and you're blessing and using me and See, that's true for all of us. So we should just be grateful. And, and truly, as he says, hey, can't I do what I want with what's mine? Isn't that lawful? Isn't that right? Isn't that just? Of course it is. Or is your eye evil? Because I'm good. So the last, and he says it again, the last will be first. And the first last, for many are called, but few chosen. 
he reminds us once again that, that things aren't always as they seem. And he is working in us and transforming us and doing things, allowing situations and circumstances that he knows he can use to make us the people he wants us to be. Those people we want to be. People like him. People that can rightly represent him. Now, in the midst of all of this, Jesus says in verse 17, or we're told, Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the 12 disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify, and the third day he will rise again. Now, the chapter starts with the parable. Now it moves to a prophecy. And let me ask you a question. Could Jesus have been any clearer? I mean, he doesn't just say, hey, some bad things are happening in the future. No, he says, here's where we're going, and here's what's going to be happening. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be condemned. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be scourged. I'm going to be crucified. But I'll rise again the third day. What we see here is that in the midst of all of this, Jesus is trying to teach them that, hey, this is what it's really all about, ultimately. Not just serving, but if necessary, suffering and and even dying, that others might have life. And in his case, it was an absolute. Jesus came, we read it in the introduction, not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. So get this. He saw the cross. He knew what he was here to do. He knew where he was going. He knew what was going to happen. And in the midst of him saying, hey, I'm going up and here's what's going to happen. We're told the mother of Zebedee or Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down, verse 20, and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand, the other on your left in your kingdom. Now, I'd suggest to you that as Jesus is talking about the cross, they're not hearing it at all. There's something he said not very long before that was still sort of playing over and over on those uh, memory tapes that we all have. In fact, Jesus had made it clear to them at the end of chapter 19 when Peter says, hey, we've left all to follow you. You know, what's in it for us? He said, assuredly, I say, and this is in verse 28 of chapter 19, in the regeneration, when the son of the man, son of man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, here's what I picture. James and John, and perhaps lots of the disciples, maybe all of the disciples, from that moment on, it's all about, okay, the kingdom's coming, there's going to be thrones, we're going to be on the thrones, we're going to wear crowns, we're going to rule, we're going to reign. This is going to be glorious, this is going to be awesome. And and they miss all that, but the first will be last, and the last will be first. Yeah, that's okay, don't, don't bother us, we're thinking about the thrones, we're thinking about the crowns, we're thinking about the position, the power, the prestige. How do we know that's what they were thinking about? Because James and John get together with mom and say, no, we, I'm, I'm, I'm picture James says, you ask him, no, no, you ask him, no, you ask him. Let's see if mom will ask him. And, and so they go and they get their mom and she does ask. And, and what, what is she asking? She's saying, well, look, I, I, I've, I've heard that, you know, my boys are going to be sitting on thrones there in the kingdom, you know, judging and all that. I just wonder if it'd be any problem if they could be in the places of greatest preeminence and, and prominence. Could, could one have your right hand and one your left? And I'm sure that if Jesus said, yeah, then they would have argued over which one would be on the right hand. But, but the bottom line is, they come because, here's Jesus saying, hey, I'm going to go up, I'm going to be handed over, I'm going to be brutalized, I'm going to be tormented, tortured, I'm going to be crucified. And, and they're like, hey, let's see if we can get the good seats in the kingdom. And, and they're just oblivious to his teaching on his coming suffering. They're just so focused on the future. Now that could be a good thing in, in one way, not in this case, but if you're so focused on the future that you're not concerned if you suffer now, that could be a real good thing. But see, the problem was they were so focused on the future, they wasn't concerned or weren't concerned if he suffered now. So they come with mom and, and mom asks the question and Jesus answers saying, you do not know what you ask. Are you able 
to drink the cup which I'm about to drink, to be baptized with the baptism that I'm about to be baptized with. And they said, now this is the boys. The mom asked the question. He turns to them. You is plural in every case. So he's not asking her, are you willing to go through this? So listen, he's talking about suffering, rejection, persecution, trial, tribulation, martyrdom. No, it's it's... A future, yeah, it's going to lead to glory. But all that had to come first, you see. And he's saying, are you guys willing to drink the cup that I'm going to be drinking? Are, are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I'll be baptized with? And they say, we are able. It's interesting. If there was ever a time where you would think you'd ask for clarification, they could say, well, what exactly is the cup and what's the... But you got to see it. They don't even care what the cup is. They don't even care what the baptism is. All they see is the glory. And they're like, whatever it takes, that's it. We're, we're there. Now, the irony, of course, is he goes on to tell them, well, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I'm to be baptized with. Now, that sounds like... Well, it sounds like bad news, but it's actually good news. What he's saying is, look, as you represent me, you too will suffer. You will be rejected. You will be tormented. But, he goes on to say, to sit on my right hand and my left hand is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. He's saying, look, these things are out of my hands. This is the Father's decision. And, and we see even here the Lord, our Lord's submission to the Father. It wasn't just in the garden that he said, not my will, but yours be done. That was an everyday prayer of Jesus. Father, what do you want me to do today? And remember, he's not just commanding us how we should live. He is our example of how we should live. He does both. He tells us what to do. And then he goes before us to show us how to do it. And so what he's saying is, listen, I know what you guys are after. And, and, and again, who deserves to be in glory with the Lord? Who deserves to sit on 12 thrones judging 12 tribes? They didn't deserve any of it. And to think, well, if we're getting that, can we get the better seats? And can we get the preeminence and the prominence? And we'll be in all the pictures. We'll be right next to them, you know. And But the bottom line here is he's saying, oh, I can't do that for you. That That's really between my father and those that he has appointed to that position. Now, verse 24, we all are going to understand. When the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brothers. Of course they were. You would be too. You'd be saying, can you believe it? Do you hear that? They're asking, to, they want the positions that we should be getting. Now, you wouldn't be moved with indignation unless you thought you were somehow getting ripped off. And so that would imply that every one of the ten thought they deserved that position that James and John were now asking for. I'm thinking if it were me, I would have thought, why didn't I think of that? Or maybe I would have thought of that. But, but here what we do see is the ten, now they're upset. And they're like, this isn't right. There's no way those guys deserve that position. And, and I bet they were at least happy to hear that, well, you know, it's no lock for them, though they asked first. Sort of like, remember you used to go on road trips with your kids? It was always shotgun, shotgun, shotgun. I was like, get in the back. Mom's riding with me. And, but that's like these guys. They're just like that, you know. I want shotgun. I want to be on the right. Well, anyway, when the ten heard it, moved with indignation. Then Jesus called them to himself. And he said, and we read it in our introduction, but, but let it penetrate and, and lock into it. You know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who are great exercise authority over them. He's just saying, look, you know what the world is like and we know what the world is like too. We know that in our culture that success is all about getting to the top and that a successful person is a person who has lots of people under them, serving them, working for them. But Jesus is saying, that's not how it's going to be in my kingdom. That how, that's not how it's going to be among my people. When he says the rulers of the Gentiles, we could understand this as, as just referring to unbelievers. Because basically at this point, there was a small group of people believing and looking forward to the Messiah. Lots of Gentiles, and we're among them, most of us. Unless you're Jewish, you're Gentile. And so, you know, most of us, of course, are Gentiles in 
a part of the kingdom. But, but he's saying, you know what it's like out there in the world. Gentiles lord it over those they, they employ or those who serve them. And they exercise great authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. He's saying it can't be that way with us. And here's why. Because greatness in God's kingdom, in God's estimation, it isn't about how many people serve you, but how many people you serve. You know, you ever see a show, the lifestyle of the poor and, and meek, or the lifestyle of the, the uh, humble and, and, no, it's the rich and famous, or the rich and shameless, or whatever the other shows are out there. And, and why? Because people applaud that. They say, wow, look at all the stuff they have, and look at all the, the things they do, and, 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 and we, if we were totally honest, would say, man, I'm jealous. I, I, I wish I could have all that stuff. I wish I could do all those things. Well, not maybe all of them, not the really bad stuff, Lord, but if you could just give me all the stuff, I wouldn't do the bad stuff. Why should they have it? They're bad. I'm good. Well, he says, look, in my kingdom and in, in, in my dispensation, my it can't be that way. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. Now, I do appreciate this from our Lord. He doesn't mind if we want to be great. You know, every little kid wants to be great. Every little kid has dreams of growing up and being something wonderful or something awesome, you know. And when I was a kid, it was always because, you know, it was simpler times. Everyone wanted to be a fireman when they grew up or a policeman or maybe an astronaut. And never forget my younger son, Josh. He wanted to be an astronaut pastor on a motorcycle. Now, he was real young. And so he won't appreciate me sharing that with you probably. But he was real little, so, you know, understand the context of it. But I'm like, what do you want to be when you grow up, son? He's like, I want to be an astronaut pastor on a motorcycle. And I'm like, well, I don't know if astronauts ride motorcycles, and I don't know if they have astronaut pastors yet, but maybe, hey, who knows? Maybe he's got a vision, and, you know, we'll get to the moon, and he'll do it, you know? But, but, but I know this, that we all start out thinking, I want to be something great. And then, well, over the years, reality sets in. And then we just, well, Lord, I just want to make a decent living. And, you know, I just, I just want to be okay. And, and then lots of us end up settling for far less than great or even good. We're like, well, just, you know, Lord, well, if we really think it through and we really grow up in him, then we're like, Lord, I just want to be what you want me to be. And what does he want us to be? He says, if you want to be great, well, let him be your servant. Be a servant. And whoever desires to be first, well, let him be your slave. So if you aspire to greatness, you, well, he's saying here it is. Serve. It's so easy. It'll be easy when you get home today. There will be things that need to be done. And either you're going to do them or someone else is going to do them. And if you're saying, Lord, just make me like you. You're a servant. Make me one too. You go home and you look around and you see what needs to be done and you do it. No, if you're one of the fortunate few that all the dishes are done, the laundry's already done, the garbage is already out, you know, you're just going to go home and relax. Don't worry. Tomorrow you'll have opportunity again. Because all that stuff piles back up. And, and basically, it couldn't be any simpler. He's saying, you want to be great? Hey, God doesn't mind that. The greatest ever is our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And, and he's saying, you want to be like me? You want to be great? Become the servant of all. You want to be first? Well, become a slave. Why? Because the last will be first. You put yourself last, well, you may end up first. But you put yourself first, well, I guarantee you, you'll end up last. And then he says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. So we have not only his command, but his example and then as they're departing from Jericho, the chapter ends with this. And, and I love the practical example of our Lord. He doesn't just teach stuff. He, he does it. He's departing from Jericho, a great multitude following after. Two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard Jesus was passing by, called out saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. Two things. They're crying out, for what all of us must ask for, mercy. They understood, hey, we don't deserve anything, we don't expect anything, but have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy. And they call him Son of David. That's a messianic title. It means they actually had a, 
a reasonable expectation that if he willed it and desired it, he could heal him. Why? Isaiah 61 said the Messiah would open the eyes of the blind. They were taking that literally. They're thinking, hey, we've heard about this guy. And they had come to the conclusion, no doubt, that he was, in fact, the Messiah, son of David. If you were here for our Christmas service, son of David, son of Abraham, it was a messianic title and they knew. So they're saying, have mercy on us, Lord, son of David. But the multitude warned them that they should be quiet and they cried out all the more saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. I'm certain today that there are many here that, well, should cry out, have mercy on me, Lord. I'm so busted. This is so not me. I'm so, well, I'm so much a part of this culture and this world. And, and, and if, if that's you, if that's what's going on in you and you realize you're far from a servant, God wants you to become a servant. And the good news is you don't need a whole lot of training or, you know, there's not a lot of, there's not a big course or a seminar you need to attend. You just start serving. Serve today. Here, serve when you go home. Serve at work tomorrow. Become that person that you know Jesus wants to make you into. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. He says it so many times, he says it so many ways, but in their case, they recognize the opportunity. And, and listen, if you know the Lord and something comes up and you have that, well, I know the Lord's trying to deal with me in this issue. That is an opportunity at the moment to deal with it and, and get right with the Lord. And I found that if I don't deal with things as they come up, if I can figure out some way to put it behind me or say, well, I'll think about it or I'm going to deal with it later. Well, more often than not, I don't deal with it at all. And I just don't change in that area. Now, there may be another area the Lord's dealing with me and that area he does make headway and things change. But my point is this, if you're convicted and you know that things aren't what they should be, then you should ask for mercy. If you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive and cleanse of all unrighteousness. And so... You know, if, if you're busted in these issues, any of them, then it's just, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus, you need to know that, well, the most important thing we've considered today is that Jesus came to suffer and die and give his life a ransom for many. That, that means he came to redeem you from your sin. A ransom, that's one who pays the debt so that the other can be restored, be set free. And that's exactly what Jesus came to do. It's exactly what Jesus did. He died for your sins and for mine. And if you've never given your life to him at all, listen, you were in the position of these blind men spiritually. And if you're sensing, man, Jesus really is here present. And, and not only do these people believe it, but I, I'm starting to believe it. You want to deal with that today. You want to say, Jesus Son of David, you want to say, Lord, be merciful to me. And here's the good news. You open your heart to the Lord Jesus today. You confess that you, just like every other person here, are a guilty sinner in his sight. He will come into your life. He will forgive your sin. All of the, the weight and shame, the burden and sin, lift it off of your shoulders. All of the... All of the everything you've been through, everything you've done, man, just forgiven and forgotten forever. Here is a beautiful verse for you to think about. Proverbs 19:17 says, whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and he will reward them for what they have done. And I'd ask you to think of it this way. In order to serve, we don't need to wait to be asked or wait for an opportunity to present itself. There are always going to be those around us who are in need, and many times we have exactly what they need. And a very important part of serving is being kind to those in need, and we are told that is lending to the Lord. What an amazing thought that I have something that I can lend to Jesus.
The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.